Welcome to McMaster University course, Computer Science and Software Engineering 2FA3 Discrete Mathematics with Applications 2. My name is Bill Farmer, and for our first lecture, we're going to discuss mathematical proof. Uh, in this course, one of the new things you'll probably be learning how to do is writing mathematical proofs in a traditional style. Uh, last time, in your previous course, Discrete Mathematics with Applications 1, 2DM3, you learned how to write formal proofs. So we're going to do a little bit of review about proofs today, and we're going to start with a question. So here's the question. In mathematics, a proof is, and there's five possible answers. So, in mathematics, a proof is similar to a scientific experiment, or for B, a preponderance of evidence for the truth of a statement, C, a plausible argument that a statement is true, D, an evaluation of a Boolean valued expression, or E, none of the above. So, I'm going to give you a moment to think about this and come up with your own answer. So, you can stop the video now and reflect. And in just a moment, I will begin, continue with our discussion. Okay, well, welcome back. The answer is E, none of the above. A, B, and C, and D are not really mathematical proofs. A mathematical proof is is really not the same as a scientific experiment. In a scientific experiment, you're trying to, you have a hypothesis, you do an experiment, you gather data, and you want to see if that data supports your hypothesis. Uh, a proof is not also not a preponderance of evidence for the truth of the statement. It's not assembling a bunch of evidence that a statement is true, and you have so much evidence that you conclude the statement is indeed true. It's not that at all. It's also not a plausible argument that a statement is true. Plausibility is not enough to be a mathematical proof. And D is a proof could be an evaluation of a Boolean valued expression, but this would be a very narrow form of proof. So what is mathematical proof? So in mathematics, a proof is simply a deductive argument that is intended to show that a conclusion follows from a set of premises. You start with a set of premises, and then you deductively show that the conclusion follows from those premises. That is what a mathematical proof is. And the statement that is proved is called a theorem. Now, the statement is going to be a statement that says a conclusion follows from a set of premises. A conjecture is a statement for which we believe the statement is true, but we don't yet have a proof. Now, proof is the preeminent technique of mathematics. It is the most important technique that allows us to do mathematical reasoning. All of mathematics is built on this idea of proof. And it's a means of establishing truth, and it is unique to mathematics. In other disciplines, they use other ways of establishing proof, similar to some of the ways I mentioned up here, like scientific experiments, coming up with a preponderance of evidence, coming up with a plausible argument. In other disciplines, they use other approaches to establishing truth. In mathematics, it's a unique and different approach using proof. So what are the purposes of proof? There's actually a bunch of purposes. I have written down eight of them here. The first is really the most important. Mathematical proofs are used to communicate mathematical ideas. They are probably the best way of communicating mathematical ideas. The reason when you look at a textbook and there's mathematical proofs given, those proofs help the reader understand ideas because the proofs are used as vehicles to communicate ideas. So that's the first purpose and probably, almost certainly, I would say, the most important purpose. 
The second purpose is to certify that mathematical results are correct, to certify that a conclusion follows deductively from a set of premises. This is also a very important purpose. The third purpose is for organizing mathematics. Mathematic, or organizing mathematical knowledge. Mathematical knowledge can be constructed as a big deductive system where we have various facts and these facts follow from other facts and ultimately every, everything starts from certain axioms that we assume. So this way of organizing mathematics depends on a structure of proof. The fourth is discovering new mathematical facts. Trying to prove conjectures can lead to discovering new facts. Proving can be a technique for, for discovery. Um, the fifth purpose is learning mathematics. Quite frankly, the best way to learn mathematics is to read and write proofs. The sixth is that proofs can show the universal, universality of mathematical results. So what this means is you can write down a proof where there are no superfluous ideas. The ideas in the proof are ideas that are absolutely necessary. Anything that's not necessary is not there. So the proof can show not only that some fact is true, but it shows that this fact is true in every situation, every context that satisfies the conditions of the theorem. So this, this is a very powerful use of proof. The seventh is to establish coherency with the body of mathematical knowledge. What this means is we have a new fact that we believe is true, maybe we have proven it, but we want to show that it is coherent with a whole body of mathematical results. And this coherency is done by proving various uh, facts that connect our new fact with this body of old facts. And finally, uh, one purpose of proof is for creating mathematical beauty. Mathematics is a utilitarian form of art. Uh, it's a utilitarian form of art like architecture and industrial design. People often don't think of mathematics as an art form, but it is. And it's one of the, uh, trying to create beauty is one of the major motivating factors that motivates people who do mathematics. Uh, mathematicians usually don't say, they won't call things beautiful as often as they will call them elegant. So they, so, so I've even known mathematicians who reject proofs, not because they're incorrect, but because they don't have a sufficient level of elegance. Okay, so there's many styles of mathematical proof. Um, I've listed a few here. Um, so remember, a mathematical proof is a argument showing that we can deduce a conclusion from a set of premises. So this argument is a deduction. And so one style is we just describe that deduction in one way or another. Another style is we prescribe how to produce a deduction. So we don't actually describe the deduction. We show how to pr produce it, what kind of reasoning, what kind of rules of inference we're going to use to produce it. A very common style is what's called the two-column format. In this format, we have on the left a bunch of statements and on the right a bunch of reasons. And the statements are the intermediate statements of our proof, the last statement is the theorem we're trying to prove, and the reasons justify these statements. Um, another style of proof is just a computation. You can think of a computation as a special kind of proof. Another style is a construction. In a construction, we show how to construct a mathematical object. And often, in many proofs, that's the key thing to do. Um, we can have geometric proofs. In a geometric proof, is we do a deduction, but we do the deduction geometrically. You, you may have done these in high school. 
where you will draw lines and circles and using basic rules about geometry you'll show how things are related and come to a proof of your theorem. Uh, geometric proofs are really a special case of visual proofs. A visual proof is where visually you show that a conclusion must follow from a set of premises. Then there are classical proofs. These are the proofs that people normally do in mathematics using classical reasoning, which is also called non-constructive reasoning. And in contrast, there are constructive proofs that only apply constructive reason. So an example of this is in, in classical uh, reasoning, you can prove that something exists without actually giving an example of that something. But in a constructive proof, if you're going to show that something exists, you must produce an instance of it, an example of it. Now, there are two very important and competing styles of proof. The traditional proof style and the formal proof style. And I'm going to talk a little bit about both of these in detail. Uh, in this course, we're going to focus on the traditional proof style. In your previous course, 2DM3, you were looking at the formal proof style. And these two proof styles are quite a bit different from each other. So the traditional proof style is an argument which is intended for a particular audience, and it's expressed in a form of natural language. This is a stylized form of natural language because it uses certain mathematical notation, uh, certain ways of writing down formulas. Uh, so by natural language, I mean a language like English, or German, Russian, Arabic, something like that. Uh, so we use natural language to express our proof. But there's something more going on. Uh, terminology and notation may be ambiguous. That means we could write down something that has more than one meaning. Very often, assumptions may be unstated. We have assumptions. They're part of our premises, but they're not ever expressed. And arguments may contain gaps. We may say that uh, B follows from A and C follows from B, but we never actually explain why C follows from B. That would be a gap. So the reader, the member of our audience that's going to be trying to understand this proof, they're expected to be able to resolve these ambiguities, identify the unstated assumptions, and fill in the gaps. So the, the proof is not complete, but we expect that the reader will be able to make it a complete proof, in, in theory at least. So the writer has great freedom to express traditional proofs in whatever manner they think is best and most effective. This is really one of the great things about tra traditional proofs. You try to write the most convincing argument you can for why something is true. And in a traditional proof, the main focus is on the key ideas. You want to make the key ideas understandable. Low-level details are usually performed by computation, or they can be just left to the reader to verify on his or her own. Now, traditional proofs are the kind of proofs you find in mathematics textbooks. Uh, they're the kind of proofs you find in mathematical research papers, for the most part. Traditional the traditional proof style is primarily good for communication. It is, that's what it's, that's what it does the best. But it's also good for organization discovery and beauty. Now in contrast, the formal proof style is something different. It is a formal proof in a, it is a, it's a formal proof which is a derivation in a proof system for a formal logic. So in this proof system, we have very 
carefully prescribed rules of how you build a derivation, how you build a formal proof. And the formal proof can be presented in two ways. We can describe the actual derivation, or we can prescribe how to create the derivation. Now, the interesting thing about formal proofs is because we're working in a formal language, we can write software to help us develop these proofs or to mechanically check them. And this is something that's very different than traditional proofs. Uh, traditional proofs are written in natural language. It is not very easy to write software that can help us develop them or check them. Now, in a formal proof style, the writer is very constrained. They're constrained by the logic, by the proof system, and the fact that every detail must be verified. As a result, the meaning of the theorem and the key ideas in the theorem may not be readily apparent to the reader. They may be buried in this, this formal derivation. So this is one way formal proofs are in contrast to traditional proofs. They're not as effective as traditional proofs for communication. But what makes formal proofs wonderful is that, is that we can mechanically check their correctness. And as a result, there's a very high assurance that the theorem they prove is correct. So the formal proof style is primarily good for certification, but it's also good for organization and discovery. Okay. So I have another question for you. Um, to learn how to write traditional proofs, you should A, read proofs given in mathematics articles and textbooks, B, write proofs of facts you already know, C, translate formal proofs into traditional proofs, D, do exercises that ask for a proof. So you can stop your video, think about this again, and then when you have an answer, start up again. I'll give you a moment. Okay, welcome back. The answer is A, B, C, and D. These are all good ways to learn how to write traditional proofs. Just like learning how to be to write well, you need to read. If you're going to want to be effective at writing English, you need to read things that are written in English. Um, it's very helpful to try to prove facts you already know. Because if you really know them, you should know why they're true. And so there's a chance that you, a much better chance that you could write proofs for these facts. And last, in your last course, you produce a lot of formal proofs. It would be very useful to take some of these formal proofs and try to translate them into, into traditional proofs and see how they will be different, see where, where the difficulties come in. And last, in this course, you're going to be given every week exercises to do. Many of these exercises will call for writing proofs. This is the most effective way of learning the material. I should even be more adamant. This is the, this is almost this is almost the only way of learning the material. If you don't do any exercises, it's very hard to learn the mathematics that we're going to be teaching you in this course. Okay, so this will be the end of the first, um, our first video lecture, and we will continue next time talking about various ways you can prove statements of various forms. Thank you very much. Talk to you next time.